How has COVID-19 affected listed real estate? And what does the future outcome look like? COVID-19 has been quite impactful for, for real estate. And I think the main reason is that it's basically called into question one of the very fundamentals of real estate, which we spoke about earlier, and that's that you know, the stability of that income stream. I think, you know, when I think of, the, of COVID-19 risks to the sector, I almost bucket them into, into two categories. The first are the short-term risks, okay? So while many companies are, are closed during these lockdown periods, um, what sort of rental are they gonna be able to pay to landlords? Okay, and that obviously impacts the, the landlord's uh, income stream and, and what they're able to pay out to investors. So that's the short-term component. But then the longer-term component is probably actually more important as it, it impacts values even more. And that is, you know, when we come out of lockdown and we go back to normal, what is the economy going to be like? You know, what type of rental levels are these tenants going to be able to stomach? You know, will some of them survive or some of them not survive? And that's sort of the more important question because, you know, a few months of lost rental is most certainly impactful. But what's going to change value even more is actually what happens in the long term in, in a post-COVID lockdown world. You know, we continue to, to update our models for, for both of these uh, lots of, of variables and assumptions. Um, I think what's very important to stress here, though, is that, you know, within the list of real estate space, I'm talking particularly within the global environment, there is such a broad uh, range of opportunities and, and a, a broad range of, of different types of real estate, which all, you know, react and are, are impacted differently. You know, from very little impact to maybe some are actually net beneficiaries of COVID to those that are very severely impacted. Give you exa an example you know, on, on the short term impacts, the data we've seen coming out of the US so far for the month of April, US apartment REITs have collected over 90% of their traditional rent roll for the month of April, which is quite a good collection. That's a stark contrast to what we've seen from certain retail stocks who are collecting somewhere around the 20 to 30% of the April rent roll. So there's an enormous difference there. You know, going on to sort of the medium to longer term impact, I think what's also interesting is to sort of think, you know, how are different sectors influenced by this? And I, perhaps I can give you one that I think we can all relate to. You know, during this period of lockdown, a lot more people have been directed into online shopping. You know, we're not able to go into shopping malls, you need to buy stuff with you buy online shopping. What that's actually done is that's actually accelerated a structural change that was happening even pre-COVID. So pre-COVID, we were seeing you know, ever increasing tilt in, in retail spend away from shopping malls and bricks and mortar physical retail towards the online channels. And obviously that was bad for shopping mall owners. The beneficiary of that was the, the logistics uh, real estate owners, the guys who own the warehouses and that which are needed to facilitate online shopping. What COVID-19 has done is actually accelerated that, that shift. If you think, you know, there are probably people that you might know who previously never um, tried online shopping, who were forced to do it now. They now say, oh, well, actually, this is quite easy. They're probably going to carry on with some form of online shopping after, you know, COVID-19 lockdown. So we see there an, an opportunity that was in play prior to COVID-19. It's actually just been accelerated. Um, like I say, you know, we, we were able to play both sides of it. We were able to underweight the retail sector. And we were able to go overweight the logistics sector, which actually benefit from, from the structural change. Another thing which we've seen play out over this, this lockdown period, and what we do right now is testimony to that, is you know, a lot more people are, are working online, doing virtual team meetings like this, downloading stuff, you know, viewing movies and series on Netflix and, and and various programs and what that means is that there's been an, a huge increase in the amount of data that has been consumed transferred and stored and ultimately that benefits the data centers which we spoke about earlier so again that was a structural story that was playing out pre-covid and it's actually just been accelerated even further by what's happened over the last month or two i think the other interesting thing to to think about is just you know, looking across our global universe, different countries are able to inject different amounts of fiscal stimulus to boost their economies, you know, both through this lockdown period as well as 
you know, when, when the economy is reopened to try and stimulate them. I mean, I saw some interesting figures coming from Bank of America earlier this week where they showed that you know, the fiscal stimulus in South Africa at the moment is about $212 per person. That's what it works out to. And that compares to the US where their fiscal stimulus announced to date, which is all likelihood to increase, is on about $8,250 per person. So you can just see the differences in the level of fiscal stimulus that's been injected into different countries. I think the UK sits around the $6,000 mark. But that'll also impact how different countries' economies are able to respond post this lockdown. You know, how have we been positioned um, uh, during this period and how have we done? We're very fortunate in that we have outperformed our benchmark year to date you know, through this COVID crisis by about 6%, which, we, which we're really happy with. Um, I think what's interesting to note from that is that a big portion of that outperformance has actually come from you know, structural stories, which we spoke about earlier, which, which were happening pre-COVID, which have been accelerated by COVID. Um, some of the outperformance obviously has also come from repositioning quickly as, as information has, has come to light. But I think that's sort of as testimony to, to the importance of that risk-adjusted approach. You know, I think having the risk-adjusted um, investment methodology has skewed our portfolio away from lower quality companies, which invariably in a crisis like this will generally un underperform. And that's why, you know, while we aim to sort of outperform the market in both positive and negative markets, our outperformance in a negative market is actually even greater because of our because of our process. So I, I think looking beyond you know, the immediate impacts of, of COVID-19, we continue to see opportunity within the real estate space. I think what's very important to, to differentiate here is the general state of global listed real estate going into this COVID crisis versus going into the 2008 global financial crisis. I think it's important to just bear in mind that, you know, the sector is in a very different place to where it was. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of compare it across um, a, a few metrics. The first is on, on balance sheet. You know, most global uh, listed real estate companies have actually been deleveraging their balance sheets since the global financial crisis. Going into 2008, your average US reach had a loan to value of about 44, 45%. At the moment, we're on about 29%. So your levels of debt have come down a hang of a lot. Also, the, the diversification of those debt sources has improved. You know, it's no longer just from one or two banks. It's from you know, multiple sources. And the duration of it. So many US REITs in recent times have actually been raising 30-year money, you know, taking a slightly higher rate, but locking in financing for the next 30 years. So that's sort of stabilized the balance sheets and has put them in a much better position to whether this crisis in the global financial crisis. Other thing that global REITs have been doing well go, you know, going into this crisis is that since 08, they've actually been improving the quality of their portfolios by selling off non-core assets you know, through the cycle. Even if those disposals were happening at slightly dilution yields, they were prepared to do it to improve the quality of the portfolio. So what you see now generally, most REIT portfolios are much better quality than they were going into the global financial crisis. And the last thing that I'd sort of draw out is that, you know, if you simplify it, I mean, real estate basically comes down to supply and demand. Uh, obviously with COVID-19, there's been a bit of a, a disruption in the demand side of the equation, but what's important to note is that over the last five or so years is there has not been an excessive amount of new supply coming onto the market, which there was pre the global financial crisis. So, so sort of pre-COVID, we were actually in a relatively good space in terms of supply and demand being relatively in check. There's been a bit of a dislocation now to, to the demand side of the equation. We believe that will come back um, through time. But overall, global listed REITs were a lot better positioned this time around um, than they were going into the crisis. So I think, Andrew, maybe just to sort of wrap that up, I think what's very important to take away from this here is that you know, different real estate sectors will be differently impacted by COVID-19. And I think it's crucially important for investors to have real estate exposure through strong active managers at the moment. So I think that's always beneficial, but I think particularly at a time like this, where the divergence between the winners and the losers is going to be probably greater than ever, I think it's absolutely uh, crucial to have solid 
reputable active asset managers who've proven their investment process and methodology, who've weathered previous crises, and you can actually make good capital allocation decisions, because I think that's what's needed within this space at a time like this.